Okay, I guess I'll, I'll kick this off. Thank you everyone who's coming in right now for joining us. Um, this is our February rounds, and this is a shared event between Merit and the Center for Simulation-Based Learning. Um, so we have, uh, we're happy to have you join us here at the end of your workday, um, assuming it's the end of your workday. Um, it's really great that we have Dr. Adam Jalewski joining us here from Queens. Um, he actually made it to his office in, in a blizzard. <laughs> the rest of us may be joining in from home. Um, so I'm just going to take a few minutes to orient you to our group um, and then hand it off to Dr. Zulewski to uh, present. Um, so Merit, uh, and, and as I said, this is a shared rounds with the Center for Simulation Based Learning, but we have some shared goals and priorities around building a community of practice that's interested in promoting high quality education research and education scholarship that can benefit the health professions uh, education community. Um, and so our interests are, are varied and we provide uh, support in um, terms of developing research uh, experiment design. We have scientists and scholars and members uh, that create a very diverse and, and rich community at McMaster University. And we're very lucky to also have collaborations that span all of Canada through our connections and our network. So if you're interested in learning more about what our group does, um, and how to join us, please go to merit.mcmaster.ca uh, to look for our calendar of events or to look uh, for the process to apply to become uh, a member. Um, I'm Dr. Sandra Montero. I'm one of the education scientists at Merit. Uh, I see through our list uh, that Dr. Matt Sybil is joining us from clinic as well, um, and certainly more of our uh, scientists will be joining us, I'm sure. Um, but you can feel free to reach out to any of us uh, if you are interested in how to connect for scholarship or uh, improve your collaborations. Okay, so for today, we uh, have the pleasure of welcoming back um, Dr. Zulewski. He has presented at McMaster before, uh, sharing with us his innovative use of eye tracking uh, in the clinical setting. Um, uh, Adam's interests, uh, I, I feel, are, have a foundation within cognitive load theory. Uh, and I believe a lot of his master's and PhD work through the uh, University of Maastricht uh, was purposed around uh, validating and developing better metrics for cognitive load. So cognitive load theory, for those of you who may not be as familiar, is often considered a good marker for expertise. Uh, as you can imagine, people that suggest they're in a higher cognitive load or are very uncomfortable with the situation, perhaps because they haven't experienced it before or being challenged for some reason. So it's really important to help uh, identify those moments for our learners uh, so that they can learn and grow from those uh, events. And Adam's certainly done a lot of work around using eye tracking and other physiological measures to tap into uh, people's experiences of cognitive load. Um, today, he's going to be talking about moving the needle in simulation uh, and helping us understand how we can build on some of this educational theory uh, around cognitive load and improve clinical practice. So thank you for joining us um, and take it away. Thanks so much, Sandra. And thanks to everyone for, for joining and a big thanks to Merit and Mac for, for having me back. Um, it's an honor to be here. So uh, would have been better in person, of course, but like all things COVID, we're, we're here online. Um, yeah. Uh, so again, looking forward to chatting with everybody. So as Sandra said, I'm a, an emergency doctor uh, in Kingston at Queens, and I do work, uh, clinical work in the emergency department and uh, research in cognitive load in human factors and then trying to understand how physicians and other health professionals make decisions during times of crisis. And that's... Um, that, that's always been a, a goal of mine and a, and a fun place to, to, to start these sorts of talks. So I put this, uh, this, these two images up uh, in the title page for a couple of reasons. First, it's to reminisce about the old days and better hair. Um, but uh, secondly, it's to also talk a little bit about the, 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 the intersection of, of SIM, and that's the picture on the, in the top screen, of course, uh, where we were performing in simulation Olympics in uh, one of the auditoriums, and then the real world, which is the, the picture below. 
And uh, to me, uh, you know, that dichotomy has always been uh, really important to consider and trying to bridge the gaps uh, has been a, a challenge and has been kind of the focus of our research over the last few years, myself and, uh, and the great team that I'm uh, surrounded by. So hopefully we'll uh, be able to bridge some of those gaps and provide some uh, new tips uh, for uh, those simulation enthusiasts, enthusiasts out there. So why does this all this why does all this matter? And you know, to me, simulation and simulation education matters because of the work that I do uh, in in real clinical medicine. And I'm, as I mentioned before, an emergency physician. I do work on the trauma team. Uh, and I have found over the years that my simulation training really did a good job preparing me for the for the job that I do now. And I, I found that it's especially useful in those high stake moments. Um, in uh, when, when decisions have to be made quickly. And I continue to go back to my simulation training, even now, six years into practice, uh, because there's so many, so many lessons that I learned from that. Uh, and I'm also privileged to be able to teach in simulation on a regular basis now. And, uh, and there's a ton that I, that I take away from all these sessions. And I think it, it's because it's so relevant in, in what we do. A lot of medicine and a lot of health professions education is better taught using different modalities. And I don't think SIM should replace those modalities, but especially in those acute settings, I feel like it has a really key role to play. So today I wanted to talk about the four main themes as part of our outline. So first, uh, this is not going to be a surprise to anyone listening to this talk, but it's obviously time for Sim to move beyond simply being cool. And you know, what does cool mean? Cool is high tech uh, technology, but in terms of educational transfer, in terms of understanding the, the foundations, uh, we're at a point certainly now where we need to be very deliberate about what we're teaching in Sim. So we'll talk a bit about moving beyond cool. We'll talk a bit about some basic educational theory as well, and uh, trying to tie it in with some of the real world uh, work that we're doing. I'll talk to you a bit about the lessons we've learned uh, in our lab, both in uh, looking at real world studies as well as in simulation. And I'm going to present a bit of a vision for what I think simulation of the future might look like. So moving beyond cool. So this is the first part. Uh, there's a, an important study that was published. It's amazing. This is now nine years ago, uh, but for, from some of the great folks here at McMaster that showed that their uh, that simulation fidelity and transfer of learning does not always occur simply in a high fidelity sim lab. And in fact, uh, low fidelity simulation is as effective or potentially even more effective and certainly more cost effective for certain individuals and definitely for the vast majority of health professions students that we teach uh, along that expertise spectrum. And I think this is a really important thing to keep in mind as I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about some cool and high tech technology that we'll be using. But I think it's important to ground this in knowing that uh, cool is not always better, and it's not better until we prove that it's better. And I wanted to just share a personal anecdote about simulation. And this picture on the right here is a flight simulator, this little pod. And I was uh, privileged to be invited to a day at Pearson Airport uh, where uh, simulation educators from across disciplines primarily aviation sim educators, but also some folks from medicine were invited uh, to go into a, a flight simulator with it. This is a true high fidelity simulator. This pod looks exactly like a plane cockpit as far as I can tell. It's got the screens, it's got the knobs and the dials. This thing moves around on its pneumatic supports. There are vibrations. It's a pretty cool piece of equipment. And we spent the morning talking about some basic aviation theory. You know, how do you how do you land a plane in general? Um, that was about three hours or so. Uh, we had lunch, and eventually we went into one of these uh, simulators. And this was a really fascinating experience for me because I grew up playing Microsoft Flight Simulator. I, by the way, I'm not getting paid by Microsoft or anybody else, but this is a picture that that I remember from my childhood, and. This was a fairly low tech sim, although at the time I suppose it was high tech. The blue blobs are buildings that you're supposed to avoid as you're trying to land this plane. And I found it incredible. Despite having a little bit of training here, despite my full day of, of sim of uh, some didactic teaching with the uh, flight simulator crew, I, I walked into this thing and I was so cognitively overloaded by all of the stimuli that this pod created that I failed miserably. 
And I, it just it reminded me of being a very junior uh, medical student uh, plopped into a sim that was way beyond my abilities. And it really brought back those feelings of anxiety and um, uh, and all the feelings that we know that our, our very novice learners feel in simulation. And, you know, it goes back to the, to the paper that I just briefly showed earlier that, you know, high tech doesn't always mean good. And it doesn't always mean that you're that you have a good transfer of learning, that you're that you're creating some kind of positive experience for your learners. And it really should potentially be reserved for the right people. And certainly I wasn't the right person. And if we look at that expertise continuum in aviation, we'll say, this is me, this is a picture of me in that same flight simulator. I am one step above my two sons who are here at the Aviation Museum uh, in Trenton uh, at, at the Military Museum. And they're you know, playing around on an old plane. I, I, maybe I'm barely better than they are. And so to them and to me, the flight simulator at Pearson was definitely cool, but did it teach us anything? Did it teach me anything? Probably not a lot. And in fact, it made me feel more anxious about the whole experience. But for this guy here, he was my co-pilot. This is, this is just a cropped photo from the one at the bottom here. For him, this means something, right? So the flight simulator means something. The, the vibrations and the movement of the cockpit, the, the various dials, the various flashing signals, that means something to him and to folks like him. But to me, it didn't. And it got me thinking about where we're at with medical simulation. Because in my own domain, as an emergency medicine physician, I remember learning how to do CPR in a mannequin very much like this. But if you put me or one of my senior colleagues into a sim lab um, and you try to teach us or teach that individual something with a mannequin like this, we're probably not going to get much out of it. And in fact, there's this phenomenon called the expertise reversal effect where you take, let's say, an attending emergency physician, because that's my world, so I'll give examples from, from that domain. And if you put that person back in the sim lab, and uh, you provide a, what we would call a high fidelity mannequin. And that's a, a piece of, of plastic, of course, with the, the monitors. And you ask that person to perform in a simulation. Paradoxically, they actually perform worse than a PGY-3 or PGY-4 in emergency medicine who's grown up with simulation. Because a lot of what that person gets out of their patient interactions are the cues from that person, right? So when a patient looks really unwell, they use that as a cue to change what their action is going to be. Whereas in a sim lab where you've got a piece of plastic in front of you, if you're a very high level provider in your own field, you may not reap the same benefits out of that simulation as somebody else. And so I think it's really key to be able to figure out where your learner is at and decide how much fidelity or functional task alignment do you actually need. And this takes us to this discussion of fidelity. So there's the idea of psychological fidelity, which is the extent to which the skills of the real task are captured by a simulated task. And that's related to functional task alignment. And so this is different than just simply engineering fidelity, right? So just having that, a that uh, airline cockpit that looks like a real cockpit doesn't mean anything if it doesn't impose and doesn't create the same cognitive processes in your pilot trainee that you're trying to get that person to get out of that simulation. And so those are really important concepts to remember as we discuss this. And it all really depends on expertise and the amount of psychological fidelity uh, has an impact depending on whether we're talking about a novice or if we're talking about an expert. And maybe I'll give one more anecdote here if I have time. I had a, uh, a really interesting case last year. Uh, I was the trauma team leader uh, at our, at our, in our eMERGE. And we had a patient who came in with some stab wounds to his chest. And immediately walking into that room, I, I can still remember the way he looked, how, how panicked he looked, how short of breath he looked, and how I felt like I needed to intervene right away. And looking at his vital signs, we quickly realized after having done a quick ultrasound that he needed a chest decompression. So he needed for us to make an opening in his chest to relieve the pressure so that his vital signs would improve. And that's, that's what we did within the first probably 30 seconds or 45 seconds of this patient interaction. And then I thought to myself, you know, the next day I was teaching some high level resuscitation fellows in our department. And I thought, you know, I'm going to throw away the case that I had made for that day. And instead, I'm going to try to replicate this case from last night that I had just experienced. 
And I tried to, to show that panic and to use the, 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 the tools that I had at my disposal with our high fidelity mannequin to try to create that anxiety, to try to create that uncertainty, to show the fact that this patient was extremely short of breath to our learners for them to act quickly. And what they did actually is they took all the stimuli that I could give them, but they, I wasn't able to present how sick this guy actually looked to them. And so they very methodically went through their case and they followed their protocols and, and they did a great job. But as an instructor, I failed in my learning objective. My learning objective there was to make them feel a sense of urgency. And I wasn't able to do that with my technology. And of course, that's not something that we need along that spectrum of expertise on the left-hand side. That's what we need further along on the right-hand side. And for our fellows who are already specialty trained, that's what we needed to, that's what I was hoping to instill in them. And I wasn't able to do that. And so in those circumstances, maybe there is a role for some fidelity in order to create that psychological fidelity that we're talking about. There's some studies that suggest that there is a benefit for progressive fidelity in simulation. And this is a study that's now more than a decade old. And in this group looked at intravenous uh, cannulation and looked at some low tech models and some higher tech models and another group that was able to go between low and high tech. And this ability to go between low and high and higher fidelity models was shown to actually uh, improve transfer of learning. And so though most of the studies show that high fidelity simulation doesn't actually lead to increased learning outcomes in the right participant group, maybe there is a role. So that's just what I wanted to suggest today as part of what we're doing. You know, so can we can we use some of the high tech that we high tech technology that we have now to create that psychological fidelity? Can we design high tech sim to capitalize on deliberate practice, which is another important concept in education in general and in simulation? And so what we've done in our lab is we've tried to recreate this to some degree. Uh, we've been, we're starting to use some augmented reality models. And this is a model here on the left where uh, this is a bed in our simulation lab. And this patient doesn't physically exist, but with the uh, HoloLens, which is what the um, Dirk, our postdoc here is wearing on in the right, uh, on the, in, the, in the photograph on the right, you're able to actually see this individual and interact with this virtual uh, augmented reality person. And what that allows you to do is to maybe take some cues from that person. If that person looks like they're really struggling to breathe, maybe we could recreate that better. And so that's, that's our hope with some of the work that we're doing to really try to maximize on that psychological fidelity. I wanted to present one paper that I thought was interesting that's fairly recent that looks at deliberate practice and some high tech simulation using virtual reality. And this is a group of uh, experienced interventional cardiologists learning to use a new technique for carotid artery angiography. And the details of the procedure are not really important, but the bottom line is this is a group of, of experts and they're learning a new technique using the virtual reality model uh, here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but that's that's what uh, what they're using. And this model allows for some deliberate practice. So the the virtual system will tell the participant, oh, you actually need to move your, uh, you know, your your instruments in such and such a way in order to uh, to accomplish the task. And um, it's a it's a deliberate practice model where it's not simply just doing, but it's doing with some coaching, and it's really capitalizing on this ability. To, to see in three dimensions in, in some ways in order to, to, to practice this hand-eye coordination. And what they found was, I thought, quite striking. And so they had a group who were trained on the virtual reality model and another group who were trained in the traditional way. And that's essentially you, uh, it's the novice apprentice model uh, where the participants would uh, go into the real world with someone who's done this procedure many times and that person would coach them. And then they did an index case afterwards, both groups did. And there was an objective assessment afterwards using a, a video recording uh, that's shown to another expert. And what they found was that those who were trained in the standard mechanism with the mentor mentee uh, model versus those who use the virtual reality system, there was quite a difference. So the procedure time was lower, the fluoroscopy time was lower and intraoperative errors, this is kind of the meat of the study, were found to be significantly less in the virtual reality trained group. So again, maybe just some more evidence for, for high tech sim 
for that fidelity, but when it's applied to your experts, to your to, to those on that expertise spectrum who are more on that right side. Again, not relevant for everybody, but it's something to consider. It's, it's when we think about where our learners at what do they need to get out of that simulation for that simulation to actually be effective for them? So I mentioned uh, the patient earlier. Uh, there's a still image. This is just a video of the same patient uh, our computer programmers have put together just a basic model. And this is basic right now. And there are going to be many iterations moving forward. But our patient kind of looks like this. And you can walk around the room and he can interact with you to some degree. And as our technology gets better, we're hoping for him to be able to have a bit of a panicked look in his eyes to, to really show that he's struggling to breathe. And I think that with the right learner group, this can, can, can reap benefits. And the, another study that's published by the McMaster folks, obviously when I was doing my lit search for this talk, I thought I would pull from this body of evidence, but this was a great study that was just recently published last month about using eye tracking to, to look at system one and system two differences in, uh, in some more junior trainees. But the point here that I wanted to make is that seeing well versus unwell, so being able to identify a patient who looks unwell or who looks well, that is a cue that's important in our clinical decision making, but not something that we traditionally have been doing in simulation just because of the, um, uh, the fact that our, our technology isn't there yet. Uh, we have a grant with the military, and that's why this man here is, is wearing military fatigues. But moving this forward, again, just a prototype uh, here, you know, watching somebody seize and theoretically seeing that a, a patient is seizing uh, or, or knowing that a patient is seizing in your simulation bay creates different emotions and creates different stress that, that may be relevant for a participant who's learning. Again, Using this sort of model may not be relevant for everybody, but for the right learner, I think there is some value here. And this is, again, just an augmented reality overlay of one of the hallways in our simulation lab. Okay. And I'll stop that video there. But the point is just to show you that with some of our work, we're hoping to be able to, to kind of push simulation a little bit further and to see whether or not this is something that is just cool or whether this is something that's cool but can actually have benefit that's demonstrable in the right uh, learner group. So that's moving beyond cool. So I wanted to talk a bit to you about some educational theory and where this is all coming from. And the basic premise here is we wanna take that novice health provider and turn her into the expert health provider. And competence is somewhere along this expertise development uh, track. And we've been focused on competence with competency-based medical education, at least for the last few years. But what I'd like to suggest is sometimes I think recently we've been getting stuck on competence and I think we need to push expertise and I think we need to push beyond competence and Anders Ericsson talked about arrested development and expertise and how do we get people beyond just competent and I think in order to do that we have to design educational modalities and simulation well and one of the ways that we've been thinking about expertise is using system one and system two thinking. And that was introduced a little bit earlier uh, by the study that I briefly referenced. And I wanted to go through a couple of examples of this just as a group here. And you don't have to answer out loud, of course, but just think about the answers to these questions in your head. So if I put this up on the screen, this means something to most people. And if I put that up on the screen, you might say, Adam, stop bothering me with useless information that I stopped thinking about back in high school. I, this is a waste of time. Or you might think, okay, well, I'm going to challenge myself and I'll figure this out. And there are some strategies and I can get that answer. And as a medical example, and this may be relevant to some, but not all, but I'm going to present it anyway. This is an ECG, so a heart tracing that to most trainees means something immediately. There's a, a recognition there. This is a what's known as a uh, ST elevation, uh, myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack essentially. And that means something to most trainees very quickly. But if I put this ECG up, this is a little more involved. I mean, sure it looks messy and it looks bad, but there are ways to strategize through this. So you can, as a medical learner, you could say, well, this is tachycardia and this is irregular and this is wide complex. And as a result, I can think this through and that means three or four different things on my differential diagnosis. And so it's probably X. 
and the actual diagnosis doesn't really matter. But the point is that I'm introducing this concept of what is system one and what is system two processing. And of course, I can't take credit for this. If I could, I would have the Nobel Prize in economics, just like Daniel Kahneman does. But this is his work and in his team's work from uh, decades ago now. But system one is a fast and unconscious and automatic system that's involved in everyday decisions. And system two is a little more slow and meticulous and effortful and is involved in complex decisions. And the way you think about your domain evolves a little bit from system one and system two with time. And I wanted to present an example uh, for you uh, from, uh, from the sports world. And this is a, a clip that was um, uh, recorded at a post uh, NBA, uh, I think it was a conference finals uh, press um, uh, uh, little press session after the game and the interviewer is uh, interviewing LeBron James who if you don't know is a one of the best basketball players of all time and she asks him a little bit about what happened during the game and I think his answer is is quite fascinating you'll see a picture in picture in a second uh, this is just to kind of uh, to make a point and I'll explain what I mean afterwards but LeBron James as he's answering the question is not actually viewing this video so keep that in mind as you're watching Start of the fourth, I think they cut it to 14. Um, do you have any idea what, I mean, I think they scored seven quick ones. Anything, what happened there? What happened? Um, we ran them, the first possession, we ran them down all the way to two on the shot clock. Marcus Morris missed a jump shot, followed it up. He got it, they got a dunk. Uh, we came back down, we ran a set for Jordan Crawford, I mean, Jordan Clarkson, and he came off and missed it. They rebounded it. Um, and we came back on the defensive end, and we got a stop. They took it out on the sideline. Jason Tatum took the ball out, threw it to Marcus Smart in the short corner. He made a three. We come back down, missed another shot. And then um, Tatum came down and went 94 feet, did a real step, and made a right-hand layup timeout. <laughs> there you go. Start of the fourth. So I, I find this clip uh, fascinating. And there's lots of clips like this. But what makes LeBron James special? Does he have some kind of incredible memory, some working memory that the rest of us don't have? You know, when I think about what happened during that, I could never come up with, you know, anything near the, the level of detail that LeBron James just did not rehearse, not practice. He just kind of described what happened. And the reason for that is I'm not a professional basketball player. There's a good reason I can't do that. And there's a good reason that he can, because he's chunked each of these plays into some kind of meaningful something in his brain. And then he's sequenced them. So for him, each of those plays represents one piece of his working memory. Whereas to me, each of those plays probably represents five or six pieces of working memory, each one of them. And then in succession, there's five or six of those, five or six of those. And so I could never come up with anything like that. But essentially what that is, is, is a, is a rechunking. It's uh, of, of information of cognitive uh, schemas. And that's what we talk about in the expertise literature. And to bring it back home for us in medicine and in health professions, we can think of this. Each of these ovals here represents a chunk of your working memory. And each of those chunks is, we're thought to have about seven or so discrete uh, ovals in our, in our working memory, each of us. And I remember being a medical student and remembering what congestive heart failure meant. And I remember thinking that it meant low oxygen and sometimes they present with high blood pressure and they have crackles when you listen to them and they're volume overloaded and you got to do something about a water pill and maybe you give them some positive pressure and each of those things took up a different chunk of my working memory and that was all I could do and then I would watch my mentors and senior colleagues and to them you know CHF was just CHF it's what it looks like and it's what you do with it and they had so many so much freedom in their working memory to do other things and so they would maybe teach a medical student uh, maybe they would bring the family in uh, to get some collateral information. Maybe they would see the next patient who needs to be seen, uh, whereas I couldn't do that. And so understanding where your learner is, I think, is key when you're teaching. And so if we take a deep, deeper dive into, into cognitive architecture and working memory, you know, what does that mean? So there's the sensory memory that we all have, and this kind of perceives incoming information. As you made your way to your computer to attend this talk, uh, maybe you were home, maybe you were in your office, and as you walked by, you could have perceived what the color of the paint on the wall was outside of your room, but you probably didn't, and maybe it was off-white, and if you go there, you can confirm that, but maybe it was yellow or blue, and frankly, that doesn't matter. Unless you attend to that information, it's gone. 
And then we go into our working memory and the working memory we have, this is what attends to information. This is where you can manipulate uh, pieces of information and it has a limited capacity and duration. And finally, if we rehearse that information, it can go into long-term memory, which is not thought to have a capacity in the same way that working memory does. And if we think about working memory specifically, we think about cognitive load. And the cognitive load is the amount of working memory resources that are being used at a given time. And we like to think of cognitive load with two main subcomponents. Some would argue there's a third, but that's for a different discussion. There's intrinsic load, which is the difficulty of a question or a topic or a task, and it's influenced by an individual's prior knowledge. So to me, reciting what happened during that basketball game would impose a lot of intrinsic cognitive load, but to LeBron James, it imposes minimal cognitive load. And extraneous load refers to load imposed by suboptimal information presentation conditions. So if you're in a traditional classroom setting, if you're in my son's grade two class and the fire alarm is going off, the kids are not gonna learn anything because they're distracted by the fire alarm, right? It's also imposed by distractions in the clinical realm. And so we've tried to conceptualize this theory and bring it into medical practice. And we've, this is the original model of cognitive load. ICL refers to intrinsic load. And when we think about traditional education, there's intrinsic load and extraneous load, all within this box of working memory. And as you get tired by the end of the day, or if it's time for lunch, your working memory gets depleted. That rectangular box gets smaller. And so your intrinsic and extraneous load starts to take up a little more space. But the key when we're starting to think about medicine and to some degree simulation is that emotion and stress and uncertainty, so that fire alarm going off in the uh, in my son's classroom is a bit different than what we think about emotion and stress and uncertainty in the clinical world. If I have to take care of, uh, of a sick child, let's say, as a trauma, that imposes some emotion and some stress, but that's not necessarily extraneous. That's not something that I can ignore. That is something that I need to learn to deal with, and I need to learn to have strategies to deal with that kind of stress. And so in our model, we suggest that emotion and stress and uncertainty in high stakes environments is not always extraneous load, it's actually intrinsic load. And why does this matter? Well, this matters because it, it changes how you teach. Often what we do is we bring people into, into the simulation lab, we teach them the medicine that they need to know, they go out into the real world and they realize that it's not just the medicine, but it's dealing with their coworkers and it's managing the stress and the uncertainty of an undifferentiated patient. And those are things that we like to say, oh, they'll learn it on the job, right? And most people do, but maybe we could challenge ourselves as simulation educators and we can say, well, can we teach that in simulation? Can we create that uncertainty that is in the real world in the sim lab? That is the ultimate psychological fidelity that I'm talking about. With time, the way our brains work changes a bit. So this is expertise development, a schematic of that. So there's schema construction and automation, and that's this arrow up here which decreases the size of the intrinsic load box because you, deal, you develop strategies to compartmentalize this knowledge like LeBron James did. But you also develop ways to improve the way you reduce information. And so a great example of this in SIM, I'm aware of my time, I can't tell too many anecdotes, but I'll just tell you one quickly. When you, we've had uh, simulations where we bring in a patient, a simulated patient who has a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. Essentially, they're bleeding to death from inside their abdomen. And one of the key pieces of information that's always given with any sick patient is that ECG, so that electrocardiogram that I showed you earlier. In this case, though, that ECG means absolutely nothing. But our novices will look at that ECG because they think that there's something to gain from that because they're being given it in, in a SIM case. Whereas our experts will say, well, thanks very much for this ECG. They'll put it to the side and they'll call the vascular surgeon because the patient actually needs surgery, not an analysis of that patient's ECG. But of course, that's only relevant in the ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm case, and it's not relevant in a heart attack case, let's say. So you have to know what your material is and who your learners are. So if you think about a case of a trauma patient coming in in the middle of the night who's injured in a snowmobile, and you know that patient's a pediatric patient, and that's creating some cognitive load, and you realize that the parents are going to be in that room, and so that's going to lead to some extra stress, and you recognize that your trauma team is coming, but you know that they're an ad hoc team, and you don't necessarily know everybody, and so you have to make quick entrustment decisions about these people, and then maybe there's a simultaneous code blue that's called overhead, and you lose some of your team to that and then you get paged about something else. And then your patient rolls in and he's acting not like a child should and it looks like he has a head injury. That's creating and imposing some 
uh, some affective stress on you. And then you look at his legs and one is blue and the other is well perfused. All these things are leading to cognitive overload. And what I presented to you here is a real case that I dealt with last winter. Um, but that's all of these aspects, that's part of doing my job. And that's something I learned on the job. But I'd like to suggest that we could teach some of these things in simulation as well, because that's the psychological fidelity of being an emergency doctor uh, in the real world. Cognitive overload is, you can conceptualize it this way, your working memory doesn't change. That's that black box. But your intrinsic load in this case and your extraneous load overwhelm it. And so one, your performance is worse, but two, you're not going to learn as much. I've just listed a couple of these uh, sources of, uh, of the stimuli in that case. And the point is what's in the green circle are things that we can teach in simulation that we typically don't. Um, and we can go into those details later. So why does this matter? Why do you care as a simulation educator? Well, I think you need to care because you need to understand your learner. You have to understand that there's certain things that you can see with their performance, but there's a lot that's invisible that's going on under the hood. And if we wanna create the right educational session for your learner, then you've gotta get it just right. And that's that Goldilocks phenomenon because we wanna target the zone of proximal development. We don't wanna overwhelm our learners, but we don't wanna bore our learners either. So I wanna tell you about some of the lessons we've learned doing our simulation work uh, and our real world trauma work that I'll describe here. And all this comes back to how do we get that psychological fidelity? Well, we can maybe try to get into the heads of our, of our learners and into our experts. So can we do that? We know that visual patterns vary between novices and experts in lots of different domains. And this is a picture on the side here of an eye tracking device. And we've used eye tracking quite a bit in some of our work. So we thought, well, could we use eye tracking to look into this a little bit? And so we have the orange circle here represents what that participant is viewing at a given time. And this is one of our senior residents who's walking into a simulation. And so she's getting information from the nurses. Uh, she's looking at the patient and at the vital signs. And this is a fascinating way of getting into the head of our learners we found, because we can look to see if there are different visual patterns between our novices and our experts. And then we can see whether or not we can teach best to these, um, to these strengths and potentially weaknesses. And so in this study, we had a couple of simulation OSCEs where we put eye tracking glasses on all our participants. We took the videos uh, from a bird's eye view to external raters, and we stratified our residents by performance levels. And we looked at some quantitative gaze analysis, and we found that our high performing residents, who, by the way, are not always the most senior ones, exhibit more strategic and accurate anticipatory behaviors in these crisis situations. And they're better able to appropriately prioritize and deprioritize stimuli. And they move quickly from a diagnostic stage to a therapeutic stage of patient management. And so we found that there were differences, but we thought, well, how can we, how can we look at this in the real world? Does this same, or do these same patterns hold true when we look at the real world and real performance? And so this is a, a study that we published a couple of years ago in Annals of Emerge Med where we wanted to get more of a picture of what the cognitive processes were of trauma team leaders during actual trauma resuscitations. And so we put these same eye tracking glasses onto our trauma team leaders, those who were identified as experts uh, in our department and across our hospital. And we wanted to find out more about what they were thinking while they were managing a trauma. And one of the best ways of doing this is to use an approach called a re-situ interview approach. So they go through their trauma with the glasses on, they forget they have the glasses on completely, and then you take them, take them aside afterwards while once things have settled, and you show them the video and you ask them to do what's called a cognitive task analysis, which is basically a think aloud that's cued. And we try to figure out what are the different things that they were thinking. So this is, this is, these are authentic cases. And so if we want to train our high flyers, our advanced trainees to become more like the experts, we have to understand what the experts are thinking. And so we found that there were a number of themes that came out of this analysis that were consistent across our experts. There was a logistical awareness that they had. So this is just one quick quote from that study. So classically, there are delays and this patient ends up in the eMERGE for hours, their operation gets delayed, everything gets delayed. And I find that's the biggest thing I'm doing here in this case. And to do that, I really have to understand the system that I'm working in and who to talk to. Another thing that came out of this work is that our experts have this, this facility, this ability to handle uncertainty, and they're okay with it, right? 
So uh, the second quote here, because the patient's clinical status evolved over the course of time, I was frequently reevaluating the treatment decisions I made. I was adjusting my therapeutic plan as I went, as more information became available. We found that our participants had directed visual gaze. So they say things like, I go back to the monitor quite frequently, often something I'm doing while I'm thinking about something else. I'm trying to keep an eye on the vital signs here. Selective attendance to information. So this is a quote from a, an attending who recognized that the residents were giving them information that wasn't really relevant, but just showing them that uh, they were noticing things in their clinical environment because the resident thought that that was something that was important. So the residents are sometimes keen to show that they know their stuff. So they'll tell you things that aren't really relevant, but it's more to show that they know their information. And finally, this anticipation. So there's a lot of things going on here. It seems like there's nothing happening. And from an untrained eye, everything is fine, but I'm finding all of this medicine. It's all anticipating. It's what could happen. And if it happens, do we have a plan? Do we have this? And so this is what's happening in the real world with our trauma team leaders. So the question is, are we creating these kind of cognitive processes in our residents during simulation encounters? That's the question. So this is a summary of those themes that I just mentioned. So we thought, well, why don't we go back to the simulation lab? Let's see what is happening in the heads of our residents as they're going through similar cases. And so this was published as a bit of a parallel study a year later. And the same methodology with eye tracking. And we took our residents and we looked at our, our, um, our trainees and we interviewed them to try to figure out what they were thinking during simulated encounters and to see whether or not there were parallels. And so we found that our high performing residents were able to anticipate and prepare for contingencies and they selectively attended to relevant information and they managed their cognitive load and they used a concurrent approach as opposed to a linear one to patient management. And so what I hope you'll see here is that there are some parallels with the real world study. And so to some degree, we should pat ourselves on the back. We're doing the right thing in simulation. But then the question is, are we doing everything right? Can we maximize what we're doing? And if we try to put the results of these studies one on top of the other, this is the, the main figure from the original uh, trauma team leader study. And certainly there is a selective attendance to information that our trainees had in simulation and there are anticipatory behaviors and they discuss the ways that they manage their cognitive load. Those things were similar across studies, but interestingly, there were a couple of things that we did not find in the simulation study. And we found that our residents did not need to be logistically aware in the simulated world. And they didn't need to have specific visual behaviors, or at least they didn't describe that. And so the question is, well, why is that? So why weren't residents talking about logistical awareness? And I think part of that is because when a resident walks into a simulation, they're told that their confederate actor is let's say a nurse or a respiratory therapist. Whereas in the real world, when you walk in, that might not be clear to you. Or there may be a trainee nurse or a trainee respiratory therapist. Or in fact, there's a resident who's there who yesterday was a general surgery resident, but now is on an anesthesia rotation and so has a different role. And that uncertainty is something we deal with in the real world, but it's something that we don't really teach. Another thing, troubleshooting equipment. That's sometimes I feel is 50% of the work that I do as an emergency physician uh, in, in kind of these critical cases. But in simulation, we don't really teach our residents to troubleshoot equipment. There are some good reasons for that. It's expensive to do so, and it takes a lot of time. But the point is that there are implications here. So there's a, lo there's a lot of parallels between simulation and the real world, but there is a divergence of what we want to be doing and what we're actually doing to some degree. And I think this is where, with the right group of participants, we can really make the biggest difference in uh, simulation training. So taking all of this together, you know, what does this all mean? What, what, where do I think the future of simulation is going? We've brought together a group of, uh, we'll call them simulation enthusiasts, and this is a group of educationalists and physicians and engineers. And we've created a, a group at Queens uh, called Simian, the Simulation and Intelligent Design and Adaptivity Network. And our goal is to be able to move the needle in simulation forward, to focus on specific subgroups of individuals who would benefit from some high tech and some new uh, and, and some new advances in the simulation world, and then to test whether or not this is actually valuable. Maybe going back to that first paper I showed, maybe we'll find none of this is useful, but I think we might actually find that there is a utility for this. One hint about that it was the study that I showed you with the interventional cardiologist. There is a signal there if you choose the right group. 
And from personal experience, you know, if I can, if I can actually meet my learning objectives with that case that I described earlier, when we had that trauma patient who needed a chest tube right away, if I can create that sense of urgency in the right learners, maybe that'll have some educational benefit from them. One way to do this is to try to measure cognitive load in real time. And our goal is to be able to use some physiological metrics to in real time be able to up or down regulate the difficulty of a simulation. This is our ultimate goal. Hopefully we'll be successful, but there's a lot of noise in the signal. And this is something that's been tried for a long time, for decades, but our engineers and our artificial intelligence and machine learning folks feel that they can clean the signal. And if we could have a clean signal and we could quickly measure how hard someone's thinking during a simulation and then up or down regulate the difficulty of that simulation, that would be the ultimate goal. So this is in its infancy, I would say, but we have had some promising results and we're moving forward. So our goal is to try to adapt. And this is just some more information about that, but essentially using virtual reality and augmented reality with the right people at the right times, can we make this happen? So stay tuned for more details about this. So this is real-time cognitive load measurement, and there'll be some papers coming out from our group. But where else I think simulation might be moving and where we can make strides in the right direction is looking at debriefing. So we all talk about debriefing being one of the most important milieus of, of improvement in simulation. And in the past, debriefing was done essentially based on expert opinion. And I'm even old enough to remember when that was the case where there weren't really frameworks. We just kind of debriefed and it was reasonably good, but it wasn't amazing. Now, in the present world, we've got some excellent frameworks that have real evidence behind them. One of them is the PEARLS framework, which we use commonly here at Queen's. But I think there might be a, a future to debriefing. And I, I'm a fan of trying to bring research paradigms kind of closer together. And so one of the things we did is to see if we could improve debriefing by using eye tracking, augmented debriefing. So remember that video I showed you of our senior resident in the uh, in that simulated encounter, we showed that video to her and to her colleagues afterwards, and we did a debriefing session around that. So instead of saying what we traditionally do, well, uh, you know, John, you, you did a great job during your simulation. Uh, I noticed that uh, you had some great communication and you seemed to pick up on all the important cues. Tell me about how that went. Instead we can hone in. We can watch the video from that resident's first person perspective, the faculty assessor and the resident, and kind of go over it together. And we can pause at a specific juncture. And instead of saying, remember that time during the sim where you might have done this, and maybe the resident perceived it slightly differently, and so we're not actually talking about the same thing, we can say, we can pause, we can say, at this point, exactly, what were you thinking? Let's delve into those cognitive processes. How can we make you better? You either made the right choice, and we should reinforce that or maybe there was a better choice to make and let's delve into that and so when we interviewed our residents after this our residents virtually all of them i think actually all of them were very positive about this they thought that this was a great way to get some real reflective feedback about what they did to really get back into their own heads because frankly they said that half of what happened in the simulation they only kind of vaguely remembered anyway because of the stress of the simulation itself but being able to recreate and relive that experience of the recite to interview was was an exciting way to do a debrief and it was new and different and it was certainly cool but like i'm suggesting today cool is not enough can we sh prove that it works and so this was a pilot study that essentially showed that it was cool but the question is, you know, can we prove that it actually has benefit? And so we have a collaboration coming up with McMaster uh, that has been delayed due to COVID, but is now hopefully going to be moving forward in the coming months, looking specifically at this. So we have an RCT planned. And can we actually show that eye tracking augmented debriefing leads to better learning outcomes? Does it lead to different cognitive processes in our residents? Or is it just a cool thing and we should focus our money and resources elsewhere? And so that's what's coming up. And so I hope I've been able to provide a bit of an overview of what SIM is and where we're at right now, the current state of affairs, a little bit of educational theory and for the um, cognitive psychologists out there, uh, hopefully we've been able to touch on some of the important aspects, at least the ones that, that, that I think are, are relevant here. We've talked a bit about the lessons we've learned in the real world, looking at cognitive processes and also uh, in simulation. 
and hopefully I've been able to present what I think is uh, the future of simulation where we're headed as a group. And some of uh, what we're doing is going to be proven to be not useful and other things will be proven to be useful. And hopefully we'll build on that and work with our great colleagues to, to move that forward, move the science of simulation forward. So very briefly, I wanted to thank all the organizations that have uh, uh, helped fund our work uh, over the years and continue to do so. And a special shout out, we've been standing on the shoulders of, uh, of giants, our collaborators and mentors. And so uh, thanks to each of them. And uh, I'll end there. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Wonderful. Um, I, I want to do the clap. Sorry, I'm going to start it. <laughs> I'll do the awkward clap and hopefully people will either virtual or turn their mics on and, and share that. I thought that was absolutely amazing. I don't know if you're able to scan through some of the comments people were posting in the chat room, in the chat window, sorry, um, about what you were sharing. I kind of feel like you're skating right on that edge, on that cutting edge of where simulation could be going. Uh, you know, the thought about tapping into what people might be thinking, whether live in that moment or getting them to reflect on that um, thought process after the fact to improve their learning uh, really, really sounds cool. Um, I've invited our audience to share questions through the chat. Um, and so I suggested that I could facilitate them. Um, I'll read one uh, from our uh, project manager, actually. Uh, so Amy Keel um, has asked if participants ever have a hard time remembering what they were thinking about. So, you know, Adam, you confirmed that they love that approach, but did any of them feel challenged to actually give you an answer about that specific moment in the simulation where the eye tracking suggested they were looking at a face or a, a readout from a machine or some other aspect? Absolutely, that's a great question. So, so I'll just, first thing I wanted to mention, I couldn't follow the chat because I would have been cognitively overloaded during the talk. So I have to kind of put that out there. Uh, but yes, thanks for the question. So I think, yeah. So there's one instance in particular that I remember from, from the work um, where uh, there a resident uh, no, visually noticed that uh, a sick patient was becoming more hypotensive and more tachycardic. So their blood pressure was going down, their heart rate was going up. Essentially they were getting sicker. And so we could see that, that she made that, that connection, at least visually. And we said, okay, well, what did you do with that information? We noticed that there wasn't you know, a reaction to, to that specifically. And it was incredible. She said, yeah, I, I remember now noticing it. And then I got distracted by the phone call from the paramedic and I never went back to it. And so that's this really cool piece of information that we would never have been able, that, wouldn't, that would not have come up during the debrief, but it was triggered by the fact that she was able to watch her eyes and um, and, uh, and that was really informative. And there were countless other examples like that. Um, and so that's where we think this is going to be useful. And so, you know, to some degree, it's cueing people and going back to the cognitive load thing. If we, if by doing this, we're decreasing the cognitive load on the participant, then theoretically, they should have more working memory to take that feedback from that instructor and to really make the most of it. So that's the theory behind this. That's how we're kind of connecting them. Mm -hmm. Well, and I guess just extending that, it occurs to it occurred to me just now that even maybe there's a potential difference, right? So if the eye tracking, um, de augmented debriefing, uh, acts like a cue, then potentially they're able to remember more about what they were thinking than your standard debriefing, right? Where you just walk, re try to re relive the moment, and people take turns pointing out decision uh, points and uh, questioning each other. That might be even an interesting metric to gather. Um, so I'm going to fuse. I've got a couple more questions, and I want to try to get through as many uh, before we start to lose our audience. But uh, there's a couple of questions about the eye tracking glasses themselves and the technology. Um, so one, just generally about how you're using them to collect eye tracking data, uh, and then maybe related to that. Um, the, oh, sorry, no, that's not related to that. So I'll leave you with that question. How does the eye tracking uh, software actually collect your data? Yeah, so there's, there, there are quantitative metrics and, and, and then qual. So at first I was really enamored by the quantitative data and spent a lot of time trying to get that to work. And there are ways to infer cognitive load based on the size of somebody's pupils. So if you look back at that question I gave you before, five times 11, your pupils would have done this and then come back down. And the more complicated question, they would have gotten much bigger 
if you actually thought it through and then come down. You can measure that with a technology, with a software, and that works in a controlled setting. The problem is in the real world, the pupillary light reflex destroys that quantitative data. So, you know, data points that are in the orders of 5% for cognitive load are dwarfed by uh, light reflex effects of 20 to 30%. And so that gets messy in the real world. And so there are other metrics you can use. Um, in the study that was just published last month, uh, they talked a little bit about uh, some of the stuff that we've done as well, where you look at sort of general viewing versus specific viewing. And there's a few other ways that you can look at quant metrics. You can look at saccades and micro saccades. So you, you can use that data and we have. Uh, but what I found really telling is, is the qual. If you put someone through a recite to interview and get them to tell you about what they were thinking, you often get so much more, the, the data you get is much richer. So in your discussion of your paper, you don't have your quantitative data and then you're trying to infer what it all means. You just go back to exactly what the participant told you and you just, you know exactly what the story is. And so if you can triangulate that, that, that tells a, a, a really compelling story. If your quant fits with what the qual is, then you don't have to infer anything and you can go ahead and, um, uh, and, and draw some good conclusions. Yeah, um, yeah, totally agree with that. Use, use of eye tracking technology really requires some careful experiment design and, and planning around your analyses, uh, creating your hypotheses up front. Um, so there's a question from Sarah Lal, who's one of our uh, experts on innovations and, and new technology. I may ask her to clarify the question, but it's the biofeedback work is really interesting. Would the algorithms account for performance or preference paradox? Um, I think she's still in the audience. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, um, but I'm, I'm putting it out there. So if uh, you want yeah, to clarify. Sorry. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in terms of performance, um, preference, paradox, I mean, sometimes what people find to be less stressful is not necessarily going to produce as good of an outcome in terms of performance, in terms of learning. So I was wondering if for the biofeedback algorithms that you're kind of planning um, to optimize, is that something that you're taking into consideration or is it really just reducing stress levels as much as possible to be able to expand that cognitive load or sorry reduce that cognitive load as much as possible as you were saying thanks for the question sir i think what you're talking about is what um what some folks like are you talking about like even like highlighting like when when people go through and they study and they highlight things it makes them feel good that they've gone through the material but they actually haven't uh, exactly invested that cognitive load yeah so we've that, that's a great thought we have not differentiated that in the work we've been looking at all data to kind of represent cognitive load and strain on working memory and mm -hmm. so the assumption is that you know the more cognitive load you have the less free working memory you have the further away from cognitive overload you are. And that's kind of been our theoretical premise, but, but that's a great point. Um, I think we'd have to design the right study to kind of look at that in, in more detail. So the short answer to your question is no, we haven't looked at that, but we probably should. Cool, thanks. Okay, um, okay I'm gonna try again to squish together some questions so that I can uh, address some of these. These are really, really great questions. Um, so Huang is sort of, is, uh, is one of our, um, pediatric emerge physicians uh, and clinical um, clinical educator. And he's interested in whether the augmented reality environment uh, distracted them at all. Uh, you know, did the technology actually work against what you were trying to uh, accomplish? But there are also two other questions about whether you found people responding to the audio auditory cues. Uh, so also related to, you know, what happens if the auditory cues were conflicting with the visual uh, or the eye tracking data. So I thought maybe I'd try to put those together uh, and have you address those. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so the, the, I guess the short answer is that we don't have that data yet uh, because what you've seen uh, with the augmented reality stuff, that is just prototype and we haven't put people through those studies as of yet. But those are the specific, okay. we're, we're worried about that. We don't want the technology to just create extraneous cognitive load, which is actually not going to be uh, is going to lead to ineffective learning. And so that is one of the things we're planning on looking at. Uh, but that's a, that's a great question. And that's where technology gets in the way of, of progress. And so we have to be really careful. 
Sure. Um, yeah, so obviously our, our audience is also on that cutting edge thinking. Um, so I'm actually going to stop there uh, in terms of facilitating the Q&A with the audience. Um, and because we've got just a few minutes left and I wanted to make sure that our audience is aware of other events that Merit is putting together. Uh, it's somewhat of a segue. So Adam mentioned that PSI is funding some of his upcoming future work. Um, so our assistant Dean, uh, Jonathan Stripano is gonna take over now and, and talk about some PSI funded events that we've got. Um, first, uh, thanks Adam for joining us here today. Um, some of your work that you're doing is really excited and we're really looking forward to being one of those centers that uh, continue some of the work that you're doing with um, PSI, eye tracking and debriefing. Um, for everyone here joining us today for Merit Rounds in combination with CSBL, uh, thanks so much for joining. Uh, we frequently partner with CSBL to deliver rounds that are of interest to both of our communities. Um, there are two events that I'd like to flag for you that if you are not aware of them, you may want to put into your busy academic calendar, realizing that our full um, approach to programming here at Merit is simply FOMO. We want to offer lots of opportunities at different times that might meet your interests and align with some availability you have. And so the mo next uh, upcoming event will be the Merit Journal Club. It's low prep, uh, low um, threshold for engagement and a high uh, practical approach. And that's February 23rd at uh, 5 p.m. We're gonna be uh, talking about a number of papers looking at learning science and curriculum. And so if that's your jam, we'd really welcome you to be there. You can find more about that at our Twitter feed, Merit underscore McMaster or um, at our website, merit.mcmaster.ca, and you can find ways to register for that. In March, we are hosting a two-day conference funded by PSI. Um, it is run on March 24th and 25th with plenary sessions at 8 to 9 a.m. on both mornings and 5 to 6 p.m. in both evenings. The overarching topic is around academic mentoring and how we can address equity, diversity, and inclusiveness by being intentional in our mentoring activities. We have speakers, um, including Srita Verma, the Dean of the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. We have speakers um, coming from Toronto, Lisa Richardson, um, among others, and also from UCSF. The talks are all freely available. They discuss how to address mentoring from a systems or an institutional point of view. What is the evidence around effective mentoring? how to mentor to ensure that we have appropriate representation at levels of leadership and scholarship and administration in our institutions, and how to be an effective mentor as a supervisor with trainees. And so we suspect there's something there for you. And again, um, you can figure out how to register for that event, March 24th and 25th, if you go to merit.mcmaster.ca and you can find all the information there.